am sent you. Jesus is claiming deity and the Pharisees knew that. That we have to be willing to repent of our sins. Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We must confess the deity of Christ before men. Jesus said, if you'll confess them before men, then I will confess you before my Father. I like that trade. That's not so hard. Then I must be baptized to wash away my sins. It was Jesus that gave the command, but all of the apostles as they went throughout the world gave the same ones that you must believe and be baptized for the remission of your sins. It's what Paul was told to do. You think about his conversion. He was already on his knees praying. Why didn't Ananias just tell him, hey, say this sinner's prayer. You're already down there on your knees. It's not what Ananias did. He said, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Paul was not saved on the road to Damascus because if he was, what sins did he commit between the time he was blinded, came into the city three days, and was on his knees praying? They couldn't have been forgiven on the road to Damascus. Baptism does that. And the passage proves it. In the third place, they did not develop spiritual leadership. And this is something that struck me when Eric was preaching on Sunday, is that Moses was a great leader of God's people. He was the man that God wanted to use to deliver them. And all that Moses told them to do throughout Scripture, you see, they did it. The Lord commanded this. They said, we'll do it. They did it. Whether it be building the ark, whether it be building the tabernacle, Moses was a good leader. He was because he was developing the one that would follow him in Joshua. Joshua was a good leader, very courageous, made tough decisions, was such an encourager of the people to continue to be strong. But then when Joshua dies and the elders that ruled with him we don't hear of the next guy in line. There, there was no leader. And then we get the book of Judges. We already know that's coming. If there's not a leader, you know it's coming. How many times at work when the boss leaves, there's no integrity of the people, they decide we're just going to do whatever we want. I saw it so many times in my 25-year career in management that when there was no leadership, People resorted to their own will. They did what they wanted to do. And a lot of times, it was the very least that they could do. In Judges 17, 6, and also at the end of the book, it said, in those days, there was no king in Israel. There was no spiritual leader. And because of that, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Jeremiah writes about it. He understands this principle when he says, Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And the part that you can enter in after that is because God directs our steps. In Proverbs 12 and 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And I'll ask the question, is that just any counsel? No, it's this counsel. God's word is wise in our steps. You know, God's wisdom is even because He placed leadership there. It's the ideal model. And I think it's important for us to talk about that. In the church, the leadership in the perfect model is a plurality of elders. And we can look in 1 Timothy 3 and we can look in Titus 1 and God says, this is the type of man men, that I want leading congregations. They need the spiritual leadership to be able to do that. You might ask why. Why is that God's plan? Well, he talks a little bit about it in Acts 20 and verse 28. Let's look there for just a moment. This is Luke recording one of the instructions that Paul is giving in Acts 20 and verse 28. And he's talking about this position, this spiritual leader. And it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. They were given a responsibility to take heed, to lead, and to feed. God is wise in that. And when they're not there, they would have problems and warnings of the ravening wolves that would come in not sparing the flock. And there's warnings of false teachers and the ability that they could be misled. 
God knows what He's doing when He has spiritual leadership in place, and we should be thankful for that. In the fourth place, you can imagine what happens when they continue to not have leadership. They look around and begin to adopt the ways of the nations that were around them. And Judges 2, continuing in our text, verses 10 and 11, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. They died. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Balaam there ending in the I am is actually a plural for the Hebrew translation. So it wasn't just one um, little deviation from that. It was many. Epiphanio talked about children, right? And here we're seeing when that piece is missing from the Christian home, then you get what we read in verses 10 and 11. There arose a generation that knew not God. That can happen to us today. It is happening to us today. It's important. I've been encouraged by your children. They know the book. They know the love of sowing the seed. We've had them go door knocking with us. Some that would rather go on door knocking than go to school. Amen to that. I appreciate those hearts and that's good parents. If we do not stand for what is right, we will adopt what's popular. It's the easy thing to do. Again, the Arkansas saying, not that it's not anywhere else, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's what was happening in Judges. They were just like the people around them. The Jews would not stand for God. They would not stand for proper worship. So they fell into idolatry. Those things that were popular and glitzy and glamorous and these idols that men were making that they would worship. In Judges 2.13, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal. And notice that one's in the singular, right? The first time we see the straying away of this idolatry, it's just Baal singular and Ashtaroth, which was a female version of the God they worshipped in places called the groves. In Judges 3, 7, we see it again. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam. Now we're into the plural and the groves, plural. In 4.1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. I wish that I didn't have to continue, but in chapter 6 and verse 1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And in Judges 10.6, you get some of the same things. We'll read that one because I want you to see the progression. I told you when we leave the obedience of the Lord that there's no limits to our disobedience. In Judges 10 and verse 6, And the children of Israel did again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth. We're adding to the list now. And the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served Him not. And it's the same thing in our own lives. We always multiply sin, whatever the small ones are. And sometimes we forget the ones of unbelief. We forget the ones of gossip, how we speak about brothers and sisters in Christ. We think about the ones where we're disobedient to authority. It's a sin. We leave things undone. We don't help when we should. And what do those things grow into? The more things that become selfish about us than those show in the lack of outward response to mankind. That's what we're here to seek and save the lost, but also to serve them. A majority does not make it right. I was reading an article that was written back in the 1800s by Jacob Kreth Jr. He was a restoration preacher. And he was talking about the idea of a majority not making things right because that's what was going on in their day. There were plenty of false doctrines that they were trying to look in the Word and battle those through logic and reason. Not some better felt than told Holy Spirit moving upon me that's different from you and you and yours is even different from that one. He was talking about looking into the Word and when he's battling those, he's just because it's a majority or just because it's popular doesn't make it right. He said, you think about the golden calf. When Aaron had the people bring all that gold and melted it down into that golden calf, who was it acceptable to? Everybody except Moses. And it was wrong. You think about Dan and Bethel. 
right? Jeroboam takes the northern kingdom. There's ten tribes in it. And he said, for, for convenience sake, we'll set up these calves in Dan and Bethel. He didn't want them to go down to Jerusalem, which was the true place of worship, because he thought they'd stay and he'd lose his kingdom. So he compromises. And who thought that Dan and Bethel was a good idea? Ten tribes. Ten out of the twelve did. The king of the north, Jeroboam, did. He wasn't right. You think about the report of the spies. I know we've talked about that this week. There were 12 that went out. Who was the report, the evil report, acceptable to? 10 of the 12 spies and everybody else. But the majority didn't make it right. They were wrong. The Pope is acceptable to all Catholics, but it doesn't make it right. Creed books and confessions of faith are popular to the denominations, but it doesn't make it right. We have a creed book, and it doesn't need to be revised every couple of years because we tested the wind to see which way popularity thinks we should go, and now we'll allow that. We need to obey God. You think about the rest of these books after Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. I'm not going to name all of them, but you go through the rest of the major and minor prophets, and you have men in every one of those books that are speaking out against this very attitude about accepting what's popular or what's right or what's easy. And where does it all end up? God is the majority. I don't care who you've got lined up. God is the majority. And He left His instruction for His people. It would lead them into captivity. Now, it took them a little bit, but in 722, Jeroboam and his Dan and Bethel calves eventually lead to them falling into captivity to Assyria in 722. And the southern kingdom lasts just a little bit longer, but they run into those same issues. God had had enough. And in 606 and 597, and then finally in 586, he destroys the temple when all are in captivity simply because they would not follow God. I think about denominationalism today and they divide up and they have their own sets of beliefs. They have their own version or their own brand of Christianity. They do not agree with the Bible. It's The popular is thought to be safe. Everybody's doing it. He can have his religion and his set of beliefs. She can have her religion and their set of beliefs. We don't have to agree with each other and we're both okay. We'll get more people if we find out what's popular and then that's what we'll say that we stand for. And it's not right. Let's look at Romans 6, 17 and 18. And a lot of times people will use this passage and wonderfully point out how we're made free from sin. But I want to look at something else in this same vein of popular thought and religion. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. This is the phrase I want us to work on in just a second. That form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And when you look in the original language of our phrase, form of doctrine, that word form is defined as a figure formed by a blow or an impression. It's an example in the technical sense that the pattern in conformity to which a thing must be made. And the way I want you to think about this word is about a coin being stamped in a die. And over and over, they put the material in and they stamp it and they stamp it. And as the coins fall out, they're all the same. And one writer wrote about this idea that is in Romans 16 and 17. They're cast into the die. They're all the same. But this is what he says. Let then but one mold of doctrine be universally adopted of standard weight, image, and superscription. And all Christians will be one in every visible respect if that's to happen. And not till then will the kingdom be visibly one. They have to be able to accept it. That superscription that he's talking about, that's... Christ church, not man-made organizations or anything else. That coin has to be stamped the same the, the whole time. And what's the die that's got the striking blow? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ and none other. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul was writing back to these Corinthians that had a problem. They were dividing themselves up. And he called it out and said that that was wrong, that they ought to all speak the same thing, be of the same mind, the same judgment. It goes along with what he would write to the Ephesians when he said there's one body. 
we should all be the same coin, regardless of where we worship. In the next place, the Israelites expected rather than appreciated their deliverance. And I know that because they continued to fall back into those cycles. America looks for deliverance in a lot of places from various kinds of deliverers like our government. And I know there's legitimate uses, but there are people that are looking for the deliverer of a welfare check or unemployment checks or uh, coronavirus bailouts. They look to our education system and they think that that's going to be the deliverer for the nation. According to DoSomething.org, 75% of the Americans who receive food stamps perform at the lowest two levels of literacy. And 90% of all high school dropouts have some form of welfare. Our education system is not delivering us. In a book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, it urges teachers to admit that evolution refutes religion. It is diametrically opposed. He said they have to admit that. The author, Daniel Dennett, said, we will attempt to teach this doctrine of organic evolution to your children at our earliest opportunity. That was said in 1996. How are they doing? 50% of adults cannot read a book on the eighth grade reading level. And on graduation day, when they hand graduates their diploma, 25% of them can't even read it. Education is not delivering this country. The judicial system, do we believe the Supreme Court will right our nation? Are we looking for our judicial system to deliver us? I'll give you one of 100,000 examples. It was 2 a.m. on November 20th. Leonardo Turiago was pulled over by two state troopers. They get into his van. They ask him if they can search it. They say, what's in that trunk? He opens up the trunk, and there's a man in there been shot five times. He attempts to flee, and they catch him. They search his apartment. They found 11 pounds of cocaine and some weapons. He takes them to the murder weapon and shows them that. He goes to court, and he gets 45 to life in prison. But his lawyer appeals it, saying that his right to search the van was coerced, and he's let free. Our judicial system is not going to deliver us. Our economic system, maybe that will be it. You think about America, we're in a good place, but many Americans are head over heels in personal debt. Some have multiple credit cards that are maxed out, trying to keep up with this lifestyle that's all going to be burned up anyway. And who's going to pay for all those expenditures? Well, I guess credit does. Let me give you the figures of the average. It's probably not us, but it's the average American has $5,000 in credit card debt. They have $20,000 they still owe in their car, over $200,000 they own on their home. A second mortgage, because they didn't like the way that home was, it's got to be bigger, it's got to be better, so they take out a second mortgage for another $42,000. And whatever else that I have to do in the way of vacations or toys, I take out other personal loans for about $16,000. So we are at a big number, and that's the average. So why is that such a big deal? Because declaring bankruptcy has almost become a national pastime. They say that 7 out of 10 that go into bankruptcy never pay back a dime. Who do you think foots that bill? Everybody else. How does God feel about that? The wicked borrows and pays not again, Psalm 37, 21. And the Bible views indebtedness as a form of servitude. The rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the leader, Proverbs 22, 7. This world is not our home and we shouldn't be more anxious to be able to acquire things than we are to acquire souls for Christ. How can you, here's another thought that we come across when you think about people that are such indebtedness, how are you able to give back to the Lord properly each first day of the week? There's the temptation to be able to cheat the Lord because after all, man's got to be paid, but we're to give of our first fruits before the government gets their taxes, before all of these creditors that we've indebted ourselves gets to that, God gets the first fruits. Or when we're in indebtedness, how do we help the poor or the homeless? How do we get a good night's sleep? Plan for our future. If a missionary were to come and ask the church for some money for a leaky uh, roof for a church down in South America, we're not able to give because, man, the new I-13 Pro is coming out. Things for us to be able to think about. We are the richest, most affluent country in the world, yet... 
Most of the Americans do not depend on the only one who can deliver them, Jesus Christ. We've come to expect everyone else to do for us when we get in trouble. And I think that this thought has overtaken our religious thoughts as well. You, you think about this, that when everybody else is providing for us and that we come to expect rather than appreciate deliverance, that we say, accept Jesus into your heart. We've got it backwards. We don't need to find Jesus to accept Him. We need to make our lives acceptable to Jesus. We've got it backwards. There's other people that talk about grace only. And this becomes a very weird subject for people because they do not understand it. I tell them, you have to understand that you need to expect something from yourself. If everybody's always delivering us, then we come to expect more from God than we do from ourselves. God says man has a part. I've provided a lot of things, but man has his part. Grace is not grease. You're not just going to get to slide into heaven. And that's the part that I think that people misunderstand about it. I want to help us with grace tonight. And when we're talking about grace, and I give this illustration, what I want you to understand is that saying that Jesus requires man to do something does not negate what grace is. Unmerited favor, a gift. So tonight, I'm giving all of you a Chevrolet Corvette. All right? You can do whatever you want with it, but I hope most of you will drive it. If you're a Ford man, you can have a GT. All right? So there's your car. I'm giving it to you. There are no strings attached to that. It is a gift. Now, at the end of this week, after you've driven all around town, you're going to have to fill it up with some more gas, aren't you? And at 3,500 miles or 5,000 miles, you're going to get the oil changed. And if you picked up a nail and got a flat tire, you're going to have to pay to replace that tire. And every six months, you're going to replace the windshield wipers. If somebody backs into you, you can go and get that repaired. Have you done things to the car? When did it stop being a gift? It's still a gift. Now, do you have a responsibility to maintain that gift? Yes. And you will do all those things to that gift because you have respect for me and what I've given you. That's grace. And sometimes we've all misunderstood. I say we all. The religious world definitely has. Nope, you just drop it into my hand and you have to give me the gas and you have to give me the oil and I'm not getting under it. You're going to change all that stuff. It's not the way it works. But it does not take away the fact that it was still a gift. Also, they did not anticipate consequences to their actions. Every time they fell back into sin and idolatry, they were oppressed by surrounding nations. And God warned them. We read it tonight in, in Joshua 23, 13. He warned them, please just do this and this and this. And all the promises that I've given you, I will make sure that they come to pass. But if you don't, then this is going to happen. We need to listen to heed God's warnings. He warns us about hell in several places. Mark 9, 43, he's talking about the fire that will never be quenched. In Jude, he talks about even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know that that place was destroyed, giving themselves over to fornication, that they'll be suffering in an eternal fire. And in Revelation 28, you've got a list of all of those, and most of them are pretty bad, but liars and unbelieving and fearful, those are ones that we can relate to. All of those will be condemned to hell unless they follow God's word. Another thing that I want us to realize for non-Christians, this is the best. Earth is the best that your life will be. But for Christians, this is the worst that your life will be. And I hope that you'll remember that because it changes your daily life when you think about it that way. David and Bathsheba, we know that one, so I'll go through this one a little quicker as we're shortening down out of here. He was on the roof where he shouldn't have been saw something that he shouldn't have seen, and it could have stopped there. But he didn't realize the consequences of his actions. He pursued her. She's married. He pursued her anyway. Her husband, one of his closest, best soldiers, I'm going to get him drunk. Oh, that didn't work. I'm going to have him killed. 
What were the consequences of that? Well, there was quite a few for David, but first of all, that child that she was um, pregnant with would lose his life. The son would die from his unlawful actions. You look back at our original illustration, remember we, we pinned the two children over here on the wall, and now we're going to pick them up and look at them because if you'll remember when we read Judges 10 through 6, that we listed off the gods of this one and the gods of that one, and do you remember two of them? The gods of Moab and the gods of the Ammonites. Those were the nations that came from those two daughters that lied with their father Lot. They did not see the consequences of your action. Here's the timeline. Those children were had. What we're talking about now is 900 years later. Sin has consequences. And they were a thorn in the side of the people of God all that time. In the final place, they married people who served other gods. Marriage is hard enough even when both are Christians. Even when they're both spiritually minded. You think about Samson who was mentioned this week. I want that Philistine woman. His parents even tried to dissuade him. Please, aren't there people among our people that would be better for you? I want her. Go get her. How did that end for him? Disaster. It followed him all the way. It even cost the life of that wife and the father-in-law. The non-Christian spouse, unfortunately, serves the God of self. Sometimes materialism, sometimes recreation, sometimes lewdness. They need to serve the God of heaven. Know that weak marriages produce weak children. Christ's bride is the church. This is the thread. We'll bring some of those things back in when people have departed from God's word. You cannot commit spiritual adultery. Jesus only has one bride. And so there's not going to be room for another one. He knows who his bride is. Because if you do commit spiritual adultery, which the denominational world is doing, he can divorce you. He has the right to do it. And you'll be lost eternally. Maybe a surprise to some titles of the ninth lesson was repentance, salvation of a nation. We haven't even talked about it. But understand that a nation cannot repent unless the individuals that are in that nation repent. It's to change one's mind that leads to a change of action. I'm not going to be so selfish and do what I want. I'm going to see what this book tells me to do. The apostles wrote a lot about Christian living, and I am bound to follow it. I'm willing to lay my will aside. I'm committing to do what this book says with my mind, with my speech, with my hands, and with my walk. I can do what the Israelites were supposed to do, I can drive out the inhabitants. Remember those ones? Ignorance, rebellious attitude, weakness. I can drive them out. I'm not going to adopt the ways of the world. In 1 Corinthians, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, he said, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We're supposed to be separate. So the goal tonight is for you to repent. As an accountable individual person, if you've sinned against God, you have to leave the world behind. In 1 John 2 15 through 17, he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in them. If any man love not uh, or love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, the three traps the devil set for us all, including Jesus himself is not of the Father, but is of the world. And if the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth, right? Remember we were talking about grace? There were some things I was going to do to that car. It's okay to do some things. He that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. So you have to pardon the expression, but changing the USA begins with you. We must avoid the pitfalls that the Israelites did during the period of the Judges. A life lived cycling through sin and oppression and repentance and deliverance is no way to live. We can only do that by obeying the gospel. And those that choose not to, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens to them? They should be punished with everlasting destruction.
from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So when you read through the book of the Judges, do what you can and seek to avoid that. I know it's been a few minutes, but we gave the plan of salvation in the middle of the lesson. It's happened at the end of each lesson each week. And if there's an opportunity for any of us that are Christians to be able to lay aside those sins, and maybe they're just small right now, but we saw what happened a lot. You can take care of that tonight. God is faithful and just to forgive you. If there's anyone that has a need, we invite you to do that now as together we stand and sing.